Next, three veteran NDP MPs announce they're leaving politics. NDP MPs Charlie Angus, Carol Hughes, and Rachel Blaney made the announcement Thursday, all for different reasons. In just last hour, some sighs of relief from around the Liberal caucus. Anthony Housefather says he'll stay, despite his concerns over the Liberal support for a motion on the Israel-Hamas conflict. Meanwhile, the Liberals pressed on with their string of pre-budget announcements. So, a lot of ups and downs. How did this affect the political pulse this week? Time to bring in our party insiders on that. Greg McEachern is a former Liberal ministerial staffer. Melanie Riche is a former communications director for the NDP. And Fred Delory is a former conservative campaign manager. All right, gang, uh, you know, a, a, a busy week. <laughs> you know, Fred, I, I want to start with you because Housefather was like the latest MP to signal his intentions today, but mm. you wanted to talk about some of the NDP MPs who have announced they're going to go. Well, it's kind of funny. If you look at some of the polling, it looks like the Liberals got a little bump and the NDP are going down, and we're seeing it with members of Parliament as well, where they get to keep <laughs> one and NDP lose three. People uh, can't see Mel flinch <laughs> off camera there, but I saw it. <laughs> look, uh, I think it says a lot, uh, the state of the NDP right now, when you have three MPs announcing like this that they're all leaving and not running again. Um, these are these are MPs that have been around a long time. There are they are in ridings that I know the Conservatives are targeting hard, mm -hmm. and from internal numbers that I've seen, are going to win by good numbers. Now uh, everyone has reasons to to get out of politics at, at certain times. Charlie Hing has been in for two decades. It's a That's long a time. long time. Yeah. Uh, but I think this really shows us the state of the NDP and what's going on over there. And maybe the, the one guy that, uh, that didn't leave, Mr. Jagmeet Singh, is, uh, is the problem here. Okay, uh, Fred's coming in hot here, Mel. Uh, the Fred Delory Decision Desk has already <laughs> awarded those three seats to the no Conservatives. Kidding. What are your thoughts on this? Because, you know, we have talked in the past of like that, that, that blue-orange fight and then the red-orange fight and the challenges for the NDP and losing incumbents with that in your future is rough is rough spot. Right, well, well, losing incumbents is always, you know, difficult going into an election, but but to your point, these are folks who have been around for a long time. Um, both Charlie and Carol are in their 60s. Charlie was there for 20 mm -hmm. years. Carol was there for 16. And I knew that they were leaving politics before I left the Hill, and that was more than a year ago. Uh, before Pierre Poirier was doing as well as he is now, and, and I think that that decision was probably made even before Pierre Poirier was mm. leader. Um, so I don't, I, I was not surprised, I was a little bit surprised by Rachel Blaney, I would say, but I was not surprised by um, those two folks announcing their retirement. Now, you know, the NDP wanted to do it all at the same time so that they could get this news out and then move forward, talk about the people uh, that they're recruiting to replace them, et cetera. Um, I will say that, you know, in places that are orange and blue, um, the NDP is attracting good candidates. They're having contested nominations in places like Alberta and Saskatchewan. So are they paying attention to Pierre Poliev doing well in those orange-blue ridings? Totally. Do I think that this is the reason that these three folks have decided to step down? Absolutely not. Um, and, and even, you know, Carol's riding goes away. So right. um, the fact that they would pick that up, that's that's not a real thing. And, and um, Charlie actually gets more orange support from the ridings that he gets. So, so I don't know how that actually would factor it in. But... Um, well, Angus's when, riding is changing fairly substantially, and, and, and he said, like, you know, after 20 years of a northern riding, the travel yeah. time and all that, and you, what it would require to get to know it, it's just, it's time for new energy, was yeah. what he said publicly. Yeah, he gets a lot of, um, actually, Carol's riding. Some right. of the orange support in Carol's riding gets added to right. his. So it is, you know, a big chunk being added to his riding, but not in a way that would, that would harm him mm -hmm. the way that it's being described. But, but one thing that I did... Um, kind of just want to talk about quickly, um, and I've already apologized to these two if I get heated. So if I get a little bit heated, I'm sorry. That's not usually yeah, my style. They were arguing before the but, show. But uh, like, yeah, <laughs> we weren't arguing. Um, but you know, um, uh, I saw you know Charlie making his announcement yesterday, and I couldn't help but see. Um, uh, Pierre Poliev come out and take a shot right away, and then you know not just take a shot at Charlie, mm -hmm. but take a shot mm -hmm. at both Rachel and and Carol. And I just, um, you know. You cannot like the guy, you cannot like his politics, and you cannot like his style of politics. Charlie and I have argued about his style of politics yeah. before, right? But you cannot um, say that uh, his um, input or his contributions to the country are not um, valuable and commendable. And, you know, Charlie, it was always clear who Charlie was fighting for and why he was doing that. So I think that that deserves a little bit of respect. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a parent. I hope to be one day. But I can't imagine that... Um, us saying that, you know, Canada can be better, um, that's who, what we need, we, that kind of mm -hmm. politics is what we mean when we say that. So, yeah, not, okay. didn't love it. Okay, okay, uh, Fred, I'm going to let you jump back in and try <laughs> yeah. to figure it out. Because this is, Pierre Pauly have tweeted, said he's he's basically running away after voting to right. raise the tax, try to take your guns and make life unaffordable and supporting you. Like, it, it was not the thank you for your contribution, happy trails. It right. was very pointed. 
all we we talk uh, often on this panel about how politicians should be sincere mm -hmm. and authentic. Mm -hmm. Mr. Polyev was sincere and authentic in who he is. But, uh, but maybe what I'll just say is fair. But if you don't have something nice to say, maybe just don't say yeah. it. Like maybe that was a time to just like not yeah. say something. And and what you know, I what what bothers me is like that's it was just unnecessary. It was a shot, just be shot. And it's not mm -hmm. just in these moments. I go back to the CP journalist that he just couldn't help but kind of go after. And other moments that we've just seen him, his instinct to be mean spirited instead of just like letting it roll off his back when you're doing well. Like you don't need to do that. So that's that's maybe more what I took. Um, what I took problem with. Uh, absolutely. I, I thought that tweet looked uh, petty and mean. And I think a lot of people uh, thought that way based on the what I've seen on, on social media. Again, I'd echo Mel's phrasing. It's unnecessary. As Prime Minister, there are going to be people that are effective, uh, affected, that are going to pass away, that you have distinct differences with, but you are the representative of Canada and you have to rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. We just went through Brian Mulroney's funeral and we heard a lot about that. I think it also shows how effective and a thorn Charlie <laughs> Angus was. Look, as one crusty guy to another, <laughs> I think you know Charlie can be crusty, um, but he was also very effective. But I'll also say he co-wrote my favorite Canadian Christmas song, which mm -hmm. is the Sky Diggers Church Bells Are Ringing. He's also, he brought a different point of view to the House, but I thought it was really unfortunate that um, the leader of the opposition chose to go that route. So, so Fred, just one quick point. I, I know you say it's authentic. Um, but, you know, if you do aspire to be a prime minister, you have to be very statesmanlike, don't you? And, and like, you're going to have countries you disagree with. You're going to have lots of, like, uh, when, when does this stop? Or does this continue, do you think, uh, if he should win the next election, that the prime minister of Canada's Twitter account will be picking shots at partisans who, who retire? Yeah, look, if you, uh, you know, if you, if you read some of the columns that people have written about Mr. Polyev, uh, about uh, if you want to understand him, just listen to him. Mm -hmm. uh, this is who he is. This is what he's going to do. He's got his uh, his elbows are up. He's a he's a scrappy guy. He's going to fight all the time, uh, just like Charlie Angus did. Charlie Angus was very very aggressive. He once uh, said some very aggressive things but, to but me but once. Fred, I go yeah. back to but. you. Your party spent millions and millions of dollars last fall to tell us he was not this guy, and we've we don't see the guy in the in the TV ads doing a pleasant puzzle with a child. And I, look, as somebody who doesn't support him, um, you know, fill your boots. He can be like this all the time. But like as somebody who reads the polls and is realistic, I find it kind of frightening. But, uh, you know, you're talking about the ads. Uh, the ads does show that side of him. There's no question he is a good family man and he has that side of him. But he's also a scrappy politician who's going to fight. And I think what the ultimate message is, is he's going to fight for Canadians. Yeah, I, I think the image of Pierre Polyev is a bit compartmentalized. What you see in social media, what you yeah. see on YouTube, what you see in the ads, what you see in press releases are, are, are different messages for different audiences. He fits that, the, he that's, fits by, the that's by design. Okay, uh, we've got to move on <laughs> from this. Uh, not that I don't enjoy this conversation, but, you know, we've got to get through everyone else's picture. Greg, you wanted to talk about the, uh, the, the, the never-ending budget day that we're going through in Canada right now. Well, you know, for a lot of reasons, as a Liberal, but as you know, a communications person, I'm very curious to watch this pre-budget rollout, mm. and it seems to be working really well uh, for the government. Um, there's been an interesting um, byproduct of it where it's kind of caught the Premier's flat-footed. Last week, a lot of the premiers did not have a good time. The ones Smith, Moe and Higgs that went before the committee to try to, you know, uh, criticize the carbon price did very poorly. Moe, I mean, you know, the ad issue panel last week at CBC, there was laughter when they started talking about Premier Moe. And now you have premiers who criticized the federal government, the prime minister. Last year, there was a lot of hay made when he said correctly that housing is not a federal responsibility and now all people want to do is talk about jurisdiction because he wants to feed kids in school. And I love the people that come out on social media and are against supporting poor kids getting fed. I think it's been a really interesting experiment. It somehow has turned the prime minister into the underdog. Um, and I find that interesting. The other part I'd say on this is that there's been an interesting grouping of people that I would, didn't think I'd see to get together around carbon pricing, asking for honesty. And you have Liberals, New Democrats, Progressives, you have Andrew Coyne saying the same thing as Liberals. You have political scientists saying, we want the truth here. You are going to get back more than you pay. And it's, I think that's good for the government. If they want to make this, the Conservatives want to make this, uh, um, an election about carbon pricing, um, this is a good lead up to have a year ahead of time.
Yeah, I'd forgotten about the prime minister getting beaten up before the cabinet retreat in Charlottetown for saying housing was, wasn't really federal, and now people are complaining about jurisdiction. But, Fred, <laughs> it, it is interesting on this that whatever you think of the merits of the policies they're rolling out, they are actually setting to some degree the agenda in a way yeah. they have not amazing. done since the pandemic, <laughs> yeah. right? No, it's amazing. They We've been talking about that uh, since we started this panel, about how they need to be doing that. So maybe they're finally taking our advice and maybe I should stop giving it. Um, <laughs> because they are doing a good job of going out there and getting this, their stories out instead of doing like the Fez, which is just one big plot that we all forget Always about. Everything comes back to the Fez. Back to the Fez. <laughs> so they're, they're actually rolling something out. They're showing they have some kind of plan and vision for the first time in a very long time. It'll be interesting on budget day if it's packaged in an actual narrative theme that they can continue to drive for the next year and a half into the next election. That's what I'm going to be looking for to see if they do that. Well, the budget's April 16th. Mel, maybe April 17th, they start rolling out the 2025 budget <laughs> just to keep this momentum going, right? Because it seems like they, they, they actually are showing a, 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 a coherent, calm strategy and putting forward alternatives and sort of forcing people to respond to their ideas for a change. Totally. I think that's the first time that we've seen that almost it feels like, I'm probably being dramatic, but it feels like since the last election almost. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there have been questions about, okay, well, what, what are the details? What does this actually mean? Is this actually going to help? But when you're um, competing against somebody who doesn't have those details most of the time, people are just hearing uh, the Prime Minister talk about the things that they want him to talk about. And I think that's the, the first time that they've been able to set the agenda to punch through. And it almost feels like, all right, we heard you. We're talking about the things, we're trying to do the things that you're t asking us to do, um, and, and credit to them for that. It is a little bit funny, I had like a few people asking about like, well, when have we seen this? Where, you know, they're campaigning on budget, the budget's not even out yet. Um, I, I don't know that it's totally off or it weird. It happens at provincial level all the time. Totally, you know? like this yeah. is, and uh, for, I mean, maybe it's not that great, and because they haven't been so good for so long, we're like, oh my God, look at them, they've got a message and a narrative. But um, I, I don't think it is surprising. To me, the test will really be, where did this go? Are they able to have it sustained? And are they able to start changing uh, their fortune with it, really, is is really the next test. Right. Their next test. Yeah, and also, like, what it does for morale. Because, you know, uh, if they're not going to care, why should we care, as you keep totally. saying, Greg, you know, about <laughs> the, 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 the vibe in the Liberals. Okay, we, we got about four minutes left. So, Mel, uh, you wanted to get to your issue. You want to talk about the foreign interference and what's going on there. Yeah, so, you know, more information out this week that's, like, a little bit troubling, I think, for people watching at home. We had uh, former leader, former conservative leader Aaron O'Toole out at the um, inquiry um, testifying this week. We had folks from, you know, all parties who were responsible for the elections or for their party's elections in the last election testifying as well. And I don't know that any um, Canadian watching at home this week felt reassured that um, our country was doing everything we could to protect our election and, and reassured that uh, they understood where we could go with this to make sure that the next one is a little mm. bit more protected. Uh, we saw a story out as well, you know, talking about how um, there was potentially foreign interference from Pakistan and India. And I just go back to, you know, all the... I don't want to say noise because that's not it's not appropriate to say that but I want to go back to um, when this was really big in the house and people were talking about it and it was really so focused on China and while that was super important I, I want to give credit to you know the NDP who were saying we need to do a little bit wider than this we need to look at it more holistically because yeah. this is a huge problem and we need to actually get to the to the root of the problem to solve it um, and I think that's that's more of the proof uh, this week well and certainly uh, Greg everything that's come to light about Modi's government in India, uh, you know, since the foreign interference, like, you know, with the Hurdip Singh Nidra allegations and the indictment in the United States, uh, you know, it was right to say it's, it's bigger than China because clearly it is. Yeah, and um, what I, I want to avoid the breathless approach that we saw last year because mm -hmm. we're going to see, even from Aaron O'Toole, we saw different reasons in his testimony. At one point, he talked about um, that their internal tracking showed that it was their positions around uh, vaccine mandates that were that was costing them the election and that there were um, connections between, you know, uh, pro-Russia um, bots that were suggesting that they were pushing this. The People's Party has come out and said, no, it wasn't us. And even in that day, there was like some convoluted excuses or explanations about what really happened there. So I want to be really careful careful that when we were looking at this, um, that we're 
kind of looking at this through a, a you know a, a more sober look than say mm -hmm. perhaps we saw last year. I'd echo what Mel said about uh, India. I mean, there was the thing I mentioned a couple of weeks ago in the fifth estate piece, mm -hmm. uh, some questions around the conservative leadership and whether or not uh, India had actors involved in that. Those are the types of things that I think we need to watch for. I also want the hope is that we will find a way to have more trust when this is done. I think we're going right. to see some ugly stuff before we get to figuring out what we need to do. We, we do, I do, we only got 90 seconds left, but I do want to talk about the liberal nomination rules uh, because letting like non-Canadian citizens and non-permanent residents vote if they're normally here is, is, is an interesting conversation. We'll have to talk about that at another day. So Fred, Fred your thoughts on, on what we learned this week on the, at the inquiry. Uh, well, I'm going to be very, um, I'll admit that I may have been wrong last year. I said that the inquiry would be a waste of time and a giant circus. It's proven to be just a waste of time. Uh, it's not the circus I thought it would be. <laughs> well, we don't know um, yet. Wait, can no, we, we don't know what look, she's no, going to I, I think if we had a, if we had a set and went down the, the right path with, with uh, Johnston, mm -hmm. with his report, we actually would be doing concrete things right now to mm -hmm. address these issues. Right. All we're doing is rehashing the same stuff. It's some new stuff. It's new tidbits. Nothing's going to come from this. Uh, I think that's going to be ready in time for the next election now. We're running out of runway here to that's actually fair. put in regulations or legislation to uh, let them. The big issue is these uh, these agencies in Canada need to be able to speak to each other better and share information. Uh, and that's not happening at right. this level. So we, 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 we all know what the, a lot of the solutions could be, but instead we're just rehashing all the stuff. But, but that is something that could change pretty quickly. And, and I, you know, should the government choose to act on it? And also I think that how the committee, uh, the site committee of civil servants functions and interacts with political parties, there's some issues raised there. There's, right? that, that, there's that, some that, room for but improvement. That, that, but that's yeah. something I think you could take action on reasonably. That's what I think quickly. parliamentarians yeah. should be doing that. They should right. be doing yeah. their job on this. Like instead of putting it to an inquiry or something, we should have committees actually looking at this stuff and taking it seriously. Yeah, yeah well, they all work together so well, Fred. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think you're right. All right, gang, you guys always work together well, so I appreciate it. Greg McKecker, Melanie Richet, Fred Delory, thanks so much.